Great, great, great. Um, all right, so hi everyone, welcome everyone. Um, so this will be the discussion room four. Passing it on, teaching, organizing online and on the ground. So my name is Sachiko. Um, hello from Tokyo. Um, it's currently 5.30 a.m. here. So, And I will be the moderator for this session. So in this room, we will be um, learning different ways in which the craft of organizing is being taught online and on the ground. So let me introduce the panelists. Um, so we have three panelists for this room. So first up, we have Win Duan. So, Win was born in Vietnam and immigrated to the U.S. with her family at the age of one. She's devoted much of her life to organizing her communities to fight for social justice. While receiving her master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School between 2009 and 2011, she joined the teaching team for Marshall Gans Community Organizing Course. In 2018, she served as the head teaching fellow for Leadership, Organizing, and Action, the online version of the organizing course, which reached 150 students in 33 different countries. And she is currently the National Training Director for Grassroots Organizing at the ACLU. And we will be talking about how the online course teaches community organizing through its pedagogy, flow, and structure. And then after that, we will have um, Jens Christian Thomason. So I'll call you Chris. Um, so Chris has been organizing, teaching, and training leaders for more than a decade, working with groups ranging from young metal workers fighting for their rights to apprenticeships in Denmark to eager and hopeful young Muslims in the US. He teaches the course People, Power, Change, How to Organize Social Movement at the University of Copenhagen, works as the national coordinator of training and education with the Danish Social Democrats, and is a co-founder of the Danish Youth Organizing Academy. Share with us about his work in the Marxist history of work. Connor is originally from Clean Gates after he knocked on his first door for then Senator Barack Obama in 2008. He has interned for local campaigns to U.S. senators and worked as a field organizer for President Obama's 2012 re election campaign. Connor is all Also, a former Teach for American Corps member in Burn 2000 as the executive director for Resistance School. And Connor will be talking about his work with Resistance School, how it all started, how its pedagogy has evolved, and how they measure impact. And each speaker will have five minutes to present. And after all the speakers have presented, we will proceed to QA. So, um, everyone listening in, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, but I would like to ask you to keep your mix, mics muted during the presentations. Thank you. All right, so let's get started with the first um, presenter, uh, Win. If you can share your screen. Can you see my screen? My PowerPoint? Yep, we can see your screen. Great. All right. Um, thank you so much, Sachko. Uh, so as Sachko mentioned, my name is Wing Doan. I was born in Saigon, grew up in the States, in a little town outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I now live in New York. And I'm currently the National Training Director for Grassroots Organizing at the ACLU. Earlier this year, I served as the head teaching fellow for the leadership organizing and action online distance learning course education program. The course, what we teach in the course, how it's structured, and I'll end with some takeaways about why it all works. And I think most of you know that uh, Marshall teaches an in-person course on the ground at the Kennedy School. Uh, this online course supplements the in-person course by reaching hundreds of people globally each year who may never have a chance to set foot on Harvard's campus. Um, so the program has been running since 2010, so eight years now. And in that time, just going through the who here, the who, who takes the class, these students, um, in these eight years, we have had 2,263 applicants. 986 of them have been accepted and enrolled. They come from 57 countries and they speak 37 different languages. And just a quick snapshot of one of the years, the year that I taught, uh, or I was a head teaching fellow rather. Um, so this is 2018 demographics, just to kind of show you how diverse this class is in so many ways. Um, 
148 students, 35 countries. You can see the gender breakdown here. Um, you can also see that not everyone who comes to the class is, uh, has English as their first language. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can also see the diversity of different campaign issues and projects that the students are working on. And so then moving into the what, what we teach, uh, this is the course content. And as you'll see, it's built around the five community organizing practices of this framework. So the course is 15 weeks long. It runs from February to May. Modules one and two begin with an overview of the course and defining what we mean by people, power, and change. We then move into storytelling around public narrative, relationship building, team structure, strategy, and action. And then we have two final wrap-up modules that discuss the shift from organizing campaigns into building organizations and ending with a celebration. One key reason why the course works so well is because students have real organizing projects that they're working on throughout the course. So they're not just learning these concepts in a classroom, but they're also applying what they're learning in real time in a real, real world context. To be accepted into the class, every student has to have a project with a real constituency that is trying to build power to create change. So here's an example of a student who applied, um, and this is their project statement at the time of applying. And then it also shows you know, how, how that statement has shifted and changed by the end of the course, how it's gotten actually a lot richer and deeper um, in terms of the organizing potential of it. I know we don't have time right now to read through it, um, but I can come back to this later if folks have questions about it. And then just getting into the how, which I actually think is the most interesting and critical piece of LOA, of why LOA works. So the pedagogy for each module follows this flow. Students are introduced to the concept. So for instance, public narrative or one-on-one. -on -one. They see a live model of it. So they watch someone's narrative or they observe a live one-on-one. -on -one. And then they get to a chance to practice the skill themselves and debrief their experience. So the flow of each week supports students with this pedagogical process of learning, where first they learn the concept in Marshall's live lecture, that usually happens on a Tuesday. Then they practice the skills in their sections. They meet with their learning buddies to deepen their practice. And finally, they reflect on their practice through a paper assignment. And then the structure in terms of how we structure people, um, which I think is also really interesting. As you'll see, we take a scaffolded approach that is very intentionally crafted around leadership development. And that's not just of the students, but also of the teaching team as well. So in the center of all this is the teaching team. And the majority of our teaching fellows were actually former students themselves. So, so Sachko uh, herself is this year the head teaching fellow. And uh, when I worked with her, she had been a former student. So there's just this real intentional engagement of people all along the, the sort of ladder of engagement. Um, and we're always looking for opportunities to invest in new leadership. Before the course begins, the teaching team receives intensive training, both on the course content, but also on how to teach, how to facilitate, and then throughout the course, the head teaching fellow and Marshall are providing ongoing coaching and support. The course admits about 130, 150 students each year. And so the teaching fellows are each responsible for a section of their own students. That's about 20 to 25 students. The students in each section are then placed into mini learning groups of about three. And they're responsible for meeting with each other, uh, practicing the skills, completing assignments together throughout the course. So I think my time might be up. Um, I, I just have a couple points here, just why it all works. You know, as you see the relationships, it really is important that all of these relationships are supporting each other, supporting the students, supporting the learning. Um, the, the authentic relationships that are going on throughout the course lead to actual commitment, accountability and commitment from everyone involved, right? To show up, to learn, to uh, be engaged in this process and this journey together, even though it is online and it's spread out across the world. Um, there's a lot of learning by doing and getting on the bike. And then finally, there's continuous evaluation, just meaning that we're, we're doing evaluations all the time. The teaching team is doing pluses, deltas, but we're also administering surveys throughout the course. So baseline survey, midterm survey, end survey. And we look at those with a, a hard eye to how to uh, take what we're hearing and course correct so that we're always improving upon our practice as we go through. That's all I've got. Great. Thank you for the presentation, Ween. All right, so we are tight, tight on time, so I'll just pass it over on to Chris. So if you could share your screen and 
present your part. Right. Thank you, Sachiko. And um, while I get this to work here, here we go. I just want to start by saying that it's an honor for me to <clears throat> be on this panel with uh, both Yu Wang and Yu Connor because um, I think a lot of what we've been doing in our course has uh, been based on the inspiration I've gotten from Wang's work and uh, what she shared about how to run a course like this and uh, also a lot of the work that the Resistance School has, has been doing. We've actually used some of the Resistance School's materials in, in our syllabus as well. So, um, Basically, what we did here is uh, we mourn the casting course, and we just finished it uh, this Wednesday, actually. Uh, and so, so, our background for doing this, uh, me along with my colleague, uh, Juan Basto, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately, is that we've been experimenting with this for eight years uh, in Denmark. Uh, but I think a lot of the applications we've had of the framework have been uh, somewhat shallow. We've managed to get into depth a, a, a few times, but what we wanted to do in this course was really to get into as much depth in terms of learning organizing as you do in Marshall's course and in what Wayne has just presented. We uh, do, uh, uh, a lot of it has been based on the exact same pedagogy as, as what Wayne just uh, presented. But then also we wanted to do it with depth in terms of the soil that we're living off of here in Denmark. So we wanted to do an adapted course that's rooted in the rich uh, organizing history that uh, we have here in Denmark that we've just been starting to explore. And then some recent examples of organizing projects here. So I'll share a bit of that. But uh, so part of my st story is also that I'm the son of a dad who is an electrician and a mom who is a, a geriatrical nurse. And I grew up in a, a big house in the countryside. My parents had just divorced and um, my mom was uh, really struggling to get, uh, get us by in everyday life. We had uh, the house fired up by a, a wood furnace that she didn't always have the time to, to actually put firewood in the furnace and not always all the money she needed to, to do it. So we had a very cold house. And in, in, I remember the mornings in the bathroom getting out uh, cold feet on the concrete floor. But then what my mom would do was uh, she would uh, take my socks in the mornings and then she would heat them up with uh, the hairdryer. And then I'd know that everything that day would be okay. And this was what she did uh, in her work life as well, providing people with care for elderly people. And that's what was her passion. And in much the same way, where the country that I'm from is uh, what's called a welfare society. So it's uh, lifted me up from uh, my background and it lifts a lot of people up, it gives them opportunities, gives them a chance to give, live good lives uh, despite class background so when i go abroad i often get the question of like why are things you hear those stories about why are we so happy and why are we so equal and this has a lot to do with organizing so one person up here on the left on the slides is miles horton and he um, founded the uh, some of you may know the, the highlander folk school which is where rosa parks and martin luther king and many others learned organizing and he did that after he had visited Denmark for two, three years and uh, uh, been part of a folk high school and studied there, learned uh, Danish. So we have uh, some, some of this, uh, uh, this organizing tradition dates in Denmark back to the mid 1800s. And this uh, welfare society that we live in is really built off of particularly the uh, peasants and the labor movement. So to 
share just a bit about how we've uh, rooted that in the class is one of the stories here is uh, that of Olivia Nielsen, who was uh, a mom of nine and a cleaner. Uh, and in 1896, she, this was really the, the starting success point of her union, the union that she started, the uh, female workers union in Denmark. And so she organized these 87 minute women who was living at a starvation wage in 1896. And over the course of eight weeks, they uh, won a 25% increase in, uh, in their wages. Um, so this was one of the first women's strikes. And through really smart and motivated organizing, these women uh, actually created a victory. And that became an organization. And that was part of a larger workers' movement that, along with the Social Democratic Party, shaped the welfare society that we know today. So uh, along with these historical examples, we also took some recent examples. So this is, this is from the class. This is where we teach strategy from a recent case uh, of the early childhood educators students campaign at campus Carlsberg in Copenhagen the campaign for better education quality and uh, this was uh, an example that we brought in taught as a live role play um, and an example that was quite close to the students own uh, uh, experience so uh, and like in the online class we said people out to do real projects. And these were some of the examples of projects that people did. So some were organizing students to give asylum seekers access to university courses. Lots and lots of climate projects. The climate movement is in many ways taking off in Copenhagen to the, for example, the green student movement here. And some of them just organized their housemates at their dorm to make a better living environment. And it's then lot, lots of international students are then taking those experiences back to their own countries right now. And uh, here is a slide with a lot of learning. So I'll share the, the slides afterwards and I won't have the time to get through every one of these. But this, what we particularly learned here is what's been a theme uh, earlier on in, in this event, uh, relationships, that uh, the learning relationships that we created between the students and how we taught them coaching and got them into triads really, really helped. And that's not what students are used to doing on campus all the time. So putting a lot of intention into doing that can really help. So, and this is a picture from this Wednesday when we ended the class, as you can see, we're all pretty satisfied and happy with uh, what, how it went and have a lot of things. That's, that's definitely my time, so I'll pass it on from here. Great, thank you. Chris. All right, so on to Connor then. All right, hi everyone. Um, do this. All right, can everyone hear me and see the slide? We can hear it clearly. Uh, we're not able to see the slide yet. Uh, Okay, sorry, one second. Super excited to be on this awesome panel. Um, I try to go quick to hit the five minute mark. Um, so I just wanna provide some context with Resistance School first about how we were created and how we were formed because the context really does define our existence and obviously um, with the name, you can tell it was on the heels of the 2016 election. Although we have also added a new tagline that says reclaim, rebuild and reimagine America um, to get away from that pure resistance language that Marshall mentioned earlier. But very important to know that we were inspired 10 students at the Kennedy School to come together and sort of talk and have therapy and be in mourning because <laughs> it was so real back then. But it was also this trigger, this inspiration. Um, of the opportunity, this movement moment that was happening in January of 2017. The Women's March was happening, indivisible, grassroots groups, people running for office. Um, there really was like a level of activation that I had not seen maybe we came together we saw this sort of this amazing opportunity but we also saw a problem um, which was 
Someone needs to mute, sorry. Just Natasha, yeah. Natasha, can you please mute your screen? We can hear your conversation. Um, so this problem of you have millions of people being activated for training and um, not really the scale to reach a lot of the people who had never really been involved. And so unlike the two previous speakers and Marshall's course and like, you know, Wellston, there's a lot of amazing training that goes on. We sort of saw our niche of really just trying to push out um, training, trying to reach people and really kind of lower the barrier to entry, centralize the best practices. Um, and so the first model was kind of like what I call this kind of is sort of like a longer um, in-person live stream training. Um, we found people like Marshall, we found a professor McCarthy at Harvard, Obama campaign alum. We basically asked them to train um, on something that we thought was a needed skill like team building and, um, and communication, train or training their own style. Um, and so it was amazing at first because we reached tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people in these trainings. But, you know, after talking to many of people like Marshall and other folks, we were starting to find that this model is while good and has the ability to reach at scale we also needed to kind of refine um, what it is that we're trying to create here and so that led us into this newer model um, which is kind of like a Khan Academy style model is how I call it in which you see all of this all of the stuff out there on online learnings and YouTube and um, TED and Khan Academy and you to me and I'm basically how to do a lot of things, but we didn't really see a centralized place to, to bring these trainings. Um, and so we created this, this new website um, and we tried to then create some consistency and some structure. And so the website, the platform, as you can see on this screen, it, it's very much in, in um, sync with a lot of the best practices of online learning. Um, and we have a speaker that comes in the studio, there's text pop-ups, there's engagement tricks, there's uh, music, you know, there's people are speaking at varying speeds. So it's really trying to create that um, online learning, but also we really wanted to create a pedagogy of training. Um, and, and here I talked to Marshall Bunch and, and really kind of a, use a, sort of how, you know, he and, and a lot of others teach and that first video is usually just like an introduction to the speaker and how they train, um, you know, who, they're, who they are, what they're doing, and really try to hook these people into the, the video. And then we do a teach or maybe multiple teaches, like on a house meeting training we did um, to teach the, the concept and how to do it. And then we do a model, which is super important, I think, um, where you actually show what it would look like. And then the, the last video would normally be a debrief of the trainer coming on to debrief that model and also do a call to action um, to go out and practice it. So essentially the, the things that we're trying to measure, you know, how, what we see as success is a couple of things, which is are people feeling more confident after they watch this? Do they feel like they have more knowledge and they have more skills. Um, are they more likely to act and are they more effective in their action? And, and the thing I'll kind of, Oh, there it is. The thing that I'll kind of end with um, is we know our model has some strengths and we know it has some limitations. And so we really were catered towards the 101, catered towards lowering the barrier to entry, lo looping people in. Um, and th those strengths are that we've kind of created a scalable way um, to provide training. It's free and accessible. These videos can be used, um, like Chris mentioned, where you can not just watch it as like an individual on the screen, but you can get people together and you can use the videos as part of a greater training curriculum. And the idea of really bringing together amazing trainers to do these. We, but the limitations are that because you're trying to reach tens of thousands of people, we lack that follow-up, that sort of that coaching, the, um, the breakouts, like what we're doing right now, the, the really ability to kind of um, coach and debrief with people and see how effective that action is. And so we really try to rely on partner organizations to be that coaching, that follow-up, um, and whereas we're trying to create the content. So I can end with um, takeaways for you if you're trying to create trainings or if you're interested in the online learning sphere, um, just three ones, which is know your goal. 
So are you trying to create scalable videos? Are you trying to create this stuff that can just kind of reach people? Or are you trying to be more um, in a small cohort um, like the previous speakers? And if you know that goal, then you can kind of think about your style and your resources. So a style that we're doing is it's um, you're in a studio and we're trying to create it. It's much higher production quality um, and therefore it costs more money. But Whereas a style might be more of a webinar or a Zoom if you're trying to create that high touch um, environment. And so the last piece is know your resources. If you do want to do um, scalable, then how are you going to get that money to, to do it? Um, because that has been the biggest challenge for us. Um, so yeah, I'll end with that and happy to talk about any other questions. Great. To figure out. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, so, right. So my understanding is that we have five, Matt, do we have five, only five more minutes for. Yeah. Yeah, that's back? right. We're just running a little over time at the moment. Okay. Got it. So we don't have much time for Q and A, but um, if anyone has a question that they want to ask, um, you can raise your hand. You can put it in the chat um, or um, mute. Um, yourself um but let me start off um this q a session um with question for actually for win um so you taught at, on the ground at harvard and or you've also taught online on the loe course so could you share with us um what you feel are like the biggest differences in, in terms of engaging people with the material and teaching um enabling them to practice this material um terms of teaching on the ground and online. yeah you know it's so funny because um, I came from teaching on the ground first and when I heard about the online class and the possibility of teaching with the online class I was like oh, I'm not gonna like it as much I'm, I'm certain and then I taught the online class and I was like I loved it um, and so I, I like it's hard for me to say one is better or you know than the other um, I think that they both have real strengths um, I think that it's actually one of the things I was concerned about is relationships, the authenticity and the connection of relationships. And like, is that possible to do online? And I think, you know, both um, Chris and Connor got at this. It's like, it isn't, it is possible. You have to be really intentional about it and you have to know your resources. Right. Um, so with online, you know, you, it's, it's higher touch, right. You, you have to be um, constantly reaching out and setting up meetings and one-on-ones on zoom with, with students, but you can still build that. Um, I think one of the things about in the classroom teaching of organizing is, um, you know, there's like a lot that people say, but then there's also stuff that people don't say. So like when you're coaching someone, right, and like trying to actually read between the lines, I find that's a lot um, easier to do when you're you're in person in a group. Um, and I also find that, you know, the group can can also help you with coaching and, and with kind of uh, holding others accountable in a group setting in a way that is harder to facilitate online because there's, you know, as we can all see here, it's, it's awkward to unmute or, you know, you have to sort of wait for permission. Um, so I think it's like really a lot of these sort of very tactical things. But I think in terms of just, you know, the, the authenticity of relationships and the ability to, to teach content and, and practice the skills, um, I actually don't think that, that it's all that different. Great, great, thank you. Yeah, but definitely the aspect of online facilitation adds another dimension to it. Um, great, so in the chat, Anna, I think you had a question. Um, do you want to share it? And if you have anyone that you want to ask in particular, you could say their name as well. Uh, hi, it's Anna here, do you hear me? Yes, uh, So hear me. the question was, uh, yes. do you need to have a lot of experience organizing yourself I mean before you start teaching um, so <laughs> I guess uh, you should have some but the question is how much yeah that's a good question where are you from Anna uh, I'm Ukrainian but I live in Austria okay all right well I think I, I could speak Bit, a bit to that. So um, I don't know if you noticed my last, first slide. It said that, you know, here in Denmark, we started out eight, ten years ago, a small group of people trying to apply this framework. And we definitely had a bit of organizing experience, all of us from. But I think back then, we really started building all of this with uh, what we had, like materials that were made 
uh, available online by uh, like the, the people of like Connor uh, at, at the time. Uh, I remember there was a new organizing institute who did a lot of made a lot of materials, and I think what we didn't get back today, all of the modeling, all of the people actually seeing people do it. So I think I would have, uh, if I was going to go back eight years, I, w I would have joined uh, the online class or something and actually built some relationships with some people who could teach me. Uh, I think this is great ending uh, of Chris's explanation and answer to the question. Uh, sorry, Chris, that we interrupted, but uh, all other breakout rooms came back to the main room. Uh, so thank you, everyone. I see that many people are saying that uh, conversations were really good and that they're just the beginning uh, of much deeper conversations uh, that we hope will be happening.